Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, Aveli I'm Emily Dyring, co-president of the ACS chapter at Seton Hall Law School in Newark, New Jersey. I was excited to spearhead the reactivation of Seton Hall's ACS chapter this past academic year because I share ACS's values of promoting equal justice and the rule of law. I'm honored to introduce my home state of New Jersey's Attorney General, Grabir Graywall, who proactively advances those values. As a Sikh American who wears a turban as part of his religious identity, as do many Sikh men, Attorney General Graywall has faced unconscionable racism, hatred, and discrimination. Since becoming the 61st Attorney General of New Jersey in January, he has even faced death threats. When he was a lawyer in private practice, shortly after 9-11, he was repeatedly harassed by a man who would point at him and say he had found Osama bin Laden. Attorney General Graywall, who is a son of immigrants from India, decided to become a federal prosecutor to proudly represent our country, showing juries and the public that there is no particular way to look American. Since taking office, Attorney General Graywall has targeted the federal government in dozens of actions and has been committed to the crucial task of improving police community relations while also tackling the opioid crisis and resisting discriminatory immigration policy. Attorney General Graywall draws upon the lessons of our country's past. For example, the abhorrent internment of Japanese Americans in World War II to address the many and widespread injustices in our current political climate. The first Sikh attorney, state attorney general in the history of the United States, Attorney General Graywall has been a vocal advocate for diverse representation in the legal field, especially among state and federal level judges. He's made it his goal to prevent hate crimes and racist bullying, and also to encourage compassion and mutual respect in the face of intolerance. Prior to his appointment as New Jersey Attorney General, he served as Bergen County Prosecutor, the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the most populous county in New Jersey. I'm interning at the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office this summer, and his colleagues there speak warmly of his leadership. To quote one, justice is his standard. Please join me in warmly welcoming to the stage an official who is a courageous force for positive progress, the great state of New Jersey's Attorney General, Gerber Graywall. Wow. Good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you, Emily, for that incredible introduction, and thank you for everything that you are doing at Seton Hall. And congratulations to all the other lawyers and students who won awards this afternoon. Uh, let's give them another round of applause as well. <laughs> ACS, I have to tell you, it is so, so great to be with you this afternoon. And as I was sitting in my office over the last couple of weeks thinking of, about what meaningful address I would give here this afternoon, I went through a lot of topics. And, and ultimately, with, with the brain trust, as I call them, uh, in my office, we came up with a 20-minute presentation to speak to you about the role of state standing in American jurisprudence. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm obviously kidding. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I've seen enough of these presentations, and I, I did my homework in looking at some of the lectures where the air just is drawn out from the room. I'm not going to do that, I hope. Uh, and if you want to talk about state standing, I'll stick around for a little bit afterwards. <laughs> Instead, what I want to do is something that Emily touched on in her introduction. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about some of the challenges that I faced in my own life, because I think they mirror a number of the challenges we're seeing in this political climate. And then I'd like to speak to you about what we're doing in New Jersey to meet those challenges head on. And if you want to talk, I already mentioned that about state standing, I'll get back to that. Um, but, but as Emily said, my name is Grabir Graywall. I was born and raised in New Jersey. I went to college right here in Washington, DC. And I went to law school right down the road in Virginia. I was twice 
sworn in as a federal prosecutor, first in Brooklyn, New York, and then in New Jersey. And a Republican governor appointed me as the Bergen County prosecutor, the chief law enforcement officer for the largest county in New Jersey. And then a Democratic governor about five months ago appointed me to be the 61st Attorney General of New Jersey. And just a few months ago, I was invited to speak to a group of young professionals at the offices of a major corporation in New Jersey. And my staff got there a little bit before I did. And they were let in without any incident or any problem. But when I got there, I was stopped at the security gate to that corporate campus. And I was told by the security guard that, quote, I wasn't on the list. <laughs> and, and after about a 15 minute back and forth trying to explain to this person that I was in fact the chief law enforcement officer for New Jersey, <laughs> was I eventually allowed in to give a speech, ironically, about diversity and inclusion. Now, I'd like to think that this was an innocent mistake or an isolated incident, but throughout my life, I have faced these small indignities and humiliations in supermarkets and stadiums, in shopping malls and restaurants, I have always, always felt the eyes of others on me. I have had children come up to me and ask me for three wishes while their parents stood by and did nothing. And I have had children, in fact, ask me if I was Osama bin Laden, again, while their parents stood by and did nothing. Listen, I have been told to go back home so many times and in such impolite terms that I sometimes forget where home is and I know those people didn't mean New Jersey. And sometimes I have endured these experiences alone and other times I have endured them and experienced them as my three young daughters watched. And some of this, as we know, is obviously the result of ignorance. But some of it really goes further than that. If you scroll through any of the online comments about my work or about my office, it can be stomach turning. I have been called at times a terrorist, a raghead, a towel head. On the day that I was nominated to be the 61st Attorney General of New Jersey, one commenter wondered where I'd park my elephant. Another wondered what I'd hide in my turban as I entered through security each day at the Hughes Justice Complex. And since becoming Attorney General, yes, death threats have become a part of life for me. Now, as a public official, I know better than to scroll down and read those comments anymore. But there is something so instructive and so telling about those comments. Because cloaked in anonymity, people speak with impunity. And in this moment, those comments provide us a window into what some people are thinking and what is actually going on at this, in this country. And what's most troubling to me right now is that these vulgar comments are no longer confined to those dark corners of the internet. They are creeping into our public discourse. They are now being said out in the open. I don't think for a moment that any of us in this room ever imagined that we would see hate-filled, torch-bearing protesters yelling, Jews will not replace us, out of all places, a college campus. And it's just not that hateful rhetoric anymore. I certainly don't think any of us in this room imagined that we would see people being killed for no other reason than what they look like, what they believe, or who they love. From the killing of, of Timothy Kaufman, fatally stabbed in New York City by someone looking to kill black people, or the killing of Shuri Navas Kochibotla, an Indian engineer shot dead in Olathe, Kansas, after the gunman told him to get out of this country, or to the killing of Heather Heyer in Charlottesville, mowed down on the streets by a white supremacist, to countless other attacks on mosques, on synagogues, on houses of worship, and as well as countless attacks that have been thwarted, thankfully. I think these events serve as a stark reminder of how easily hateful language can creep back into our discourse, escalate to violence, if we fail to address it or do anything about it. 
And as I stand here in Washington, D.C., in our nation's capital, I'm troubled and I worry that too many of our national leaders have failed us in this regard. Far too many of our leaders have accepted hate and anger and division as a normal part of our political discourse. And I believe it is this acceptance that is contributing to the rise in bias crimes that I am seeing in my state and that we are st seeing nationwide. And it's directly impacting the safety and well-being of our communities. And I think the question then naturally becomes, what do we do about it? Well, in part, we push back. We hold accountable those who seek to harm others. And as my state's chief law enforcement officer, I will use all the tools at my disposal to protect those in danger. We will bring to justice any person who commits acts of violence against another, regardless of whether they're motivated by hatred of a particular race, ethnic group, or religion. Because an act of hate against any one of our communities should be treated as an act of hate against all of our communities. And we have to be willing. We have to be willing to call out these hateful comments and inaction by our leaders in the face of such comments, regardless of the consequences. We must also push back against the federal government when it fails to protect all of its residents. We must push back especially when the federal government violates our Constitution, our laws, and our sense of decency. Since becoming Attorney General, I have joined with colleagues across the country to push back against these violations. We have pushed back against efforts to rescind protections for our dreamers. We have pushed back against repeated efforts to ban travel from Muslim-majority countries. And we have pushed back at attempts to add a question to the census, a question that serves no purpose but to drive our immigrant communities further into the shadows. We have pushed back against attacks on the health care rights of women. We have pushed back against the many, many attacks on our environment. We have pushed back against attacks on our laborers. We have pushed back on attacks against consumers. We are challenging the repeal of net neutrality. And we have pushed back against efforts to bar soldiers from military service for no other reason than their gender identity. And so we stand ready in New Jersey to use our authority to challenge the federal government wherever and whenever it breaks the law. We don't do this because it's popular, and we don't do it because it's easy. We do it because we have made a choice. We have taken oaths to protect our states, and these decisions directly affect our residents. But here's the thing. Pushing back alone cannot be the entire solution. I simply reject the notion that the only way to reclaim this moment is by fighting the federal government at every single turn. Rather than simply opposing what's going on in Washington, we must also use our energy to build something, to build something that we can all be proud of. And I've taken this to heart back in New Jersey. That's why in the Garden State, we are using the powers of the Attorney General's office to build something that can stand as a model for the rest of the country. And this should come as no surprise to you in this room, because as Justice Brandeis put it best a century ago, our states are our laboratories of democracy. And so states must now lead the way in advancing our progressive values. And that's why this work, this work, building a new vision for our state and a model for our country is what excites me the most. And here's how we're doing it in New Jersey. At a time when it looks like the bonds between law enforcement and the communities we serve are breaking, we are strengthening police community relations. And that's not a talking point. We have actually taken concrete steps over the last five months to do so. We have issued a first-of-its-kind directive 
calling on law enforcement agencies to release footage involved, of officer-involved shootings. We've required our police departments to develop early warning systems to root out problematic officers early. We're revising rules governing how and when law enforcement officers can inquire about immigration status. And we're developing a statewide conviction review unit to assess claims of innocence by those convicted of serious crimes. And we're training law enforcement, law enforcement and prosecutors alike, on implicit bias. We're redoubling our efforts to recruit law enforcement and prosecutors, prosecutors that reflect the diversity of our state. And now let me also say this. Our law enforcement officers in New Jersey and throughout the country work incredibly hard to ensure our safety and to ensure our well-being. And none of these measures are meant to criticize them, but rather they are meant to ensure that they continue to engage in positive and trust-filled interactions with the public. But it's not just law enforcement. At a time when our dreamers are under attack, we have shown in New Jersey that they are welcome and that they are part of the fabric of our state and of our country. In my second week as Attorney General, I had one of the, big, the greatest privileges that I've ever had, and that was to swear in Parthiv Patel to the New Jersey Bar, a dreamer, the first time that happened in New Jersey. And lawyers like Parthiv and, and Carla Perez, who we'll hear from later today, they truly inspire me, and they should inspire all of us in this room. That's why we welcome dreamers in New Jersey, and we know they're going to do great things. At a time when our youngest students in New Jersey and across the country are at risk from the epidemic of gun violence sweeping our nation, at a time when our students are leading the way in this effort, we are taking actions in New Jersey to protect them and all of our residents from firearms. We're putting out reports for the first time, sharing data that shows exactly where the guns used in crimes in our state are coming from. And we're doing that to shine a light, because we may have strong gun laws in New Jersey, but they don't have similarly uh, strong gun laws everywhere. And so we're using that to shine a light on states where it's simply too easy to buy these weapons. And we formed a coalition of like-minded states called States for Gun Safety to work together to tackle this problem. At a time when the federal government is dialing back its efforts to protect consumers, we're stepping up. Listen, I have been a federal prosecutor and a state prosecutor for the majority of my career. And I have a fundamental problem with foxes guarding the hen house, especially when it comes to the Department of Education. So we wrote a letter to Secretary DeVos inviting her, begging her, really, to join us in protecting victim, students who have been victimized by for-profit colleges. We didn't get a response, but we did tell her that if she wasn't going to do her job, that we would. These are just a, a, few of, a few examples, a few examples of the many steps we're taking in New Jersey to pursue justice, to protect the safety of our communities, and to protect our consumers. But I think what this should show all of you is that while we live in a time of unique challenges, we live in an era of unique opportunities as well. This is our chance to show everyone in this country what it looks like when people, regardless of ideology, regardless of background, regardless of party, come together to solve problems. And this is our chance to serve as a model of good and responsible government, a model that's not based on simply opposing others, but on building an affirmative agenda that improves the lives of all of our residents. So all of this provides me some solace when I hear those hateful comments. It provides me some solace when I receive a threat because I don't, quote, look American. 
And all of us in this room should take a great deal of comfort in knowing that individuals far greater than us and far braver than us have overcome far, far worse than we're experiencing now. And I think that's what makes this country so great, that we rise above attacks and we rise above insults. We find ways to unite. We find ways to come and join each other around common goals, principles, and values. We are able to create communities that view our differences as virtues. And we come together to build something, something greater and stronger than existed before. I think that's what this political climate demands from each of us, from everyone in this room. We cannot simply continue to speak out against, what, against what's going on in Washington. We have to do something more to show others what our vision looks like. I've told you what I'm doing in New Jersey, and it's just the start. But I now urge each of you to do the same in your communities. We all don't need to advance the same priorities because what works in California might not work in Texas. But we all do need to act. So whatever your priorities are, go home or stay here in Washington and push forward an affirmative agenda. Show everyone what our laboratories of democracy are capable of. And go show everyone how our progressive visions will better the lives of all residents. This moment calls for nothing less. And again, it must start with each of you in this room, and it must start immediately. Because as Dr. King said, our tomorrow is today. And this, this is our fierce urgency of now. And here's the thing. I am so confident that we are up to the task. You, we, all of us, lawyers, we are the profession, after all, that brought Brown versus Board of Education. We are the profession that brought equality and integration to our schools. We are the profession that fought for voting rights to ensure that everyone, man or woman, black or white, had an equal vote. We are the profession that fought for LGBT rights to ensure that all people were treated with dignity regardless of who they loved or what gender identity they expressed. And really, we are the profession, and you are the lawyers in this room that flock to airports to assist individuals coming back to this country or arriving in this country in the face of an unconstitutional travel ban. No matter the issue, no matter the moment, we as lawyers, we always stand up. We stand up to ensure that America continues to strive to be the best version of itself. That's why I have every confidence that we will do so now in this moment. ACS, I am so honored to have had the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. I look forward to working with each of you in the days, months, and years to come as we work together to build a nation that we could all be proud of. Thank you so much.